Two weeks ago, we covered the case of Lisa Marie Young. We are back on Victoria Island this week, a one and a half hour drive south of Nanaimo to Victoria, located on the southern tip of Vancouver Island, British Columbia, Canada. A place where there is one degree of separation between people. Everyone is connected to everyone, to a certain extent. Twenty-four-year-old Lindsay Buziak was absolutely loved and treasured by her family and many friends. She was a spectacular young woman who could make friends with anybody and was loved by everyone. Lindsay pursued a career that was a natural fit for her. It suited her love of people and her popularity. Her father, Jeff Buziak, has been in the industry for 30 years. Lindsay landed a job at Remax Camosum Real Estate in Victoria. Remax Camosum has multiple offices around the Greater Victoria area. Lindsay lived in Victoria with her boyfriend, Jason Zalo, who was a mortgage broker who also had a real estate license and was deeply connected to that world. Jason's mother, Shirley Zalo, was a manager of Remax Camosum Real Estate, where Lindsay worked. Lindsay was smart and driven, really focused on her career, and wanted to succeed as a real estate agent. A call she received from a new client on the 31st of January 2008 really got her attention. The call was from a female. She told Lindsay that her husband had just gotten a transfer to Victoria and they needed to look for a new house. They wanted a home near the city ready to move into. They wanted a house with at least three bedrooms, three bathrooms, a large master bedroom and a separate area for a nanny. And they were in a rush. They were headed to the island on the ferry that weekend. They were staying for three days to look at places, and they wanted to buy something within that three-day period. What really got Lindsay's attention was the price range they were looking at, up to $1 million. 2008, the economy wasn't doing so great. Suddenly, a mystery woman rings up and wants a million-dollar house within three days. This was massive. Although she was excited at the prospect of her new big money clients, there was something nagging at her. Something that wasn't quite right about the call. The female caller spoke with an accent, but Lindsay couldn't quite put her finger on what the accent was. She described it as kind of Spanish, but not really. To Lindsay, it sounded like the caller was faking the accent. Lindsay was nervous and apprehensive. She was a junior real estate agent just starting out. Why had these mystery clients called her? Lindsay did ask the female caller that question, and she said a previous client of Lindsay's made the recommendation. Lindsay called that previous client to check, but she was out of luck. Her previous client was out of town, and she couldn't be contacted. At first, Lindsay struggled to find a house that matched what her clients wanted. One she felt did was a five-bedroom, four-bathroom executive home at 1702 D'Souza Place in the upmarket Victoria suburb of Saanich. The listing price for the house was $964,000. The client said they would be headed to the island on Saturday the 2nd of February on a later ferry, and they asked to meet Lindsay straight at the house at 5.30pm. On the day of the viewing, Lindsay got another call from her mystery clients to confirm the booking, but this time it wasn't from the female, it was from a male. The male said his wife wasn't feeling well and wouldn't be attending, so just to expect him there. Before meeting the couple at the house, Lindsay had a late lunch with her boyfriend Jason Zalo at a restaurant called Source. Lindsay had been expressing her concerns about the call and the couple to her friends and family. She called her dad who told her to make sure there was somebody with her at the viewing. That somebody was Jason. Jason assured Lindsay he would be there and encouraged her to go get the million dollar sale. 
they finished lunch and paid the bill at 4.24pm. From source, they left separately, Jason telling Lindsay he would be at the viewing. Jason left and went to see clients at SHC, which was nearby. He was working on a deal there. SHC is an auto shop. He arrived there at 4.29pm. Lindsay is believed to have gone home to change her clothes. Jason left SHC at 5.30pm. He left there with his mortgage partner, Cohen Oatman, who also played in his hockey team. They weren't really close friends as such. They were business partners who played on the same hockey team. They are captured on security camera getting into Jason's Range Rover at 5.30pm. Jason is seen walking to the vehicle next to Cohen. Cohen gets in the passenger side of the vehicle while Jason is standing right next to him, almost as if he was escorting him. Jason then turns, looks up at the security camera, and walks around to the driver's side. Jason then sent Lindsay a text message saying, I'll come meet you, and I'll be 10 to 15 minutes or so. Lindsay had expressed her concerns about the clients and the viewing. Something about the call had made her apprehensive, and she requested Jason meet her at the viewing. Jason doesn't contact her until 5.30pm when the viewing was due to start, saying he's 10 to 15 minutes away, as captured on the security footage and phone records. Lindsay replied to Jason's text message, OK, I'll see you in a bit, I've got to go, the Mexicans are here. The Mexicans was Lindsay's nickname for the couple. At 5.29pm, Lindsay had accessed the real estate lockbox at 1702 De Souza Place. D'Souza Place is a small cul-de-sac street. The house itself was on the corner block of D'Souza and Torquay Drive. At 5.30pm when Jason is underneath a security camera getting into his Range Rover, Lindsay was seen to greet the mystery couple by the back of her car in the driveway of the house. There was no other car in the driveway. Lindsay and the mystery couple then make their way inside the house. Jason starts making his way but has to call his brother Ryan Zalo for directions. Despite Lindsay's concern about the viewing and that they had just had lunch together, he didn't know how to get there and had to ring brother Ryan to find out. At 5.38pm, Jason sends another text message to Lindsay, just a couple of minutes away. Lindsay never opened that message. At 5.41pm, Lindsay's Blackberry made a phone call out. The police believe this was a pocket dial, a direct result of Lindsay being attacked, the buttons being pressed during the attack. It's within that window of 5.38pm to 5.41pm that police believe Lindsay Buziak was murdered. At 5.45pm, Jason and Cohen drive in to D'Souza Place. Jason drove past the house and he and Cohen noticed movement at the door. It was getting dark and the lights were on in the house. They saw silhouettes through the opaque glass of the front door. Because it was opaque glass, they couldn't get a clear look. They couldn't say for sure how many people were at the door. Jason drove up to the end of the cul-de-sac and parked his Range Rover, facing away from the house. Jason still had a view of it in the rearview mirror. They stayed in Jason's Range Rover for 10 minutes. At 5.55pm, Jason drove out of the Sousa place and turned right onto Torquay Drive, parking along the side of the house. Jason did this because he didn't want to be the meddling boyfriend. There was a large fence and trees and shrubbery, so really no view of the house at all from where he parked. About 10 minutes later, Jason sent another text message to Lindsay, Are you okay? Lindsay didn't respond. Jason and Cohen then got out of the car and walked up to the front door. They found it locked. Jason could see Lindsay's shoes in the foyer through the opaque glass of the front door. The time is now 6.05pm. Jason and Cohen had been there for 20 minutes, and this is the first time they got out of the car and approached the house. Jason checked the lockbox to see if there was a key there, but there wasn't. There was an electronic keypad for the garage door. Jason called his mother Shirley and asked if she knew the code for the garage. Shirley didn't know it but said she would make a call to see if she could get it. Shirley rang Jason back quickly, saying she wasn't able to get the code. Jason started to panic and called 911. 
He told the operator that his girlfriend was in the house doing a viewing. The door was locked and he couldn't get in. Jason gave the address and said he was going to break in. Jason boosted Cohen over the fence. Cohen gained entry via the already open back patio doors. He walked through the house and unlocked the front door. Jason quickly pushed past Cohen as he was opening the door. He ran straight up the stairs and Cohen stayed downstairs. Jason found Lindsay straight away in an upstairs bedroom. Lindsay had been viciously murdered, stabbed over 40 times, throat cut. Jason tried to give her CPR. Another call was made to 911 at 6.11pm. The police were already on their way responding to the first 911 call. When police arrived, Jason and Cohen were waving their arms in the upstairs bedroom window. The police went into the home, up to the bedroom, and took both Jason and Cohen to the police station separately. Police secured the crime scene and deployed canine units to try and track the killers, but they didn't pick up much, leading police to believe the killers escaped in a vehicle parked on Torquay Drive. Neither Jason nor Cohen heard or saw the killers leave. What motive could somebody have to lure a young real estate agent to her death like that? Robbery was quickly ruled out. There was nothing in the house to steal. Every room was completely empty. It was for sale and ready to move into. And Lindsay's purse, watch, wallet and money were all left at the scene. There was no evidence of sexual assault either. A forensic examination located footprints and fingerprints matching Jason and Cohen which confirmed they were telling the truth with their story as to how they came to be inside the house. The police are extremely tight-lipped about it, but they located DNA samples at the crime scene as well. Just weeks before her murder, Lindsay had gotten breast enlargements. Time had been spent by her attacker to mutilate these. They also found three fence boards had been kicked out on the back fence of the house. He could have walked off the back patio, veered off to the right, and walked through that gap in the fence. The gap led you to a spot behind trees and shrubs where you wouldn't be seen from the road. From there, you can make your way onto Torquay Drive into a getaway vehicle, or over into the back neighbour's yard and garage. Police canvassed the area, which is when they located the witnesses who saw Lindsay greeting the couple at the front of the house in the driveway about 5.30pm. Lindsay shook their hands and appeared to be introducing herself, leading police to believe she hadn't met them before. It was clear that Lindsay had been lured to the scene of her murder by this couple. So who were they? One witness was able to assist police with a sketch of the female suspect. She was described as Caucasian, aged 35 to 40 years old, with short blonde hair. Police suspect that this could have actually been a short-cropped blonde wig. She was wearing a bright, colourful dress that really stood out. It was white, black, and either red or pink coloured, with a distinctive pattern. The male was described as Caucasian, six feet tall, medium build, dark hair, and he was also well-dressed, wearing a light to medium brown coloured jacket. The sketch and descriptions of the couple weren't released to the public until the first anniversary of Lindsay's murder in 2009, the police saying they waited until the one-year anniversary in order to maximise exposure. Police were able to find the phone number that the mystery couple had used to contact Lindsay. It was stored in her Blackberry under their nickname, The Mexicans. The number belonged to a cell phone which was purchased at a convenience store in Vancouver in late November 2007. Due to the time that had passed, there was no surveillance tape available of that purchase. The phone was a pay-to-talk phone. The only registration required was to type in your name and address online, and any old name and address would do. The name used to register the phone was Paolo Rodriguez, which is believed to be a fake name. The address used was legitimate, but it belonged to a business in Vancouver, believed to be completely unrelated, just an address picked at random. Despite being bought six weeks earlier, the phone was only activated days before the murder. It was activated in Vancouver in late January 2008, and that's when the first calls to Lindsay were made. 
The phone then travelled to Victoria from Vancouver 24 hours before Lindsay's murder. This information was gathered through phone tower records. The phone was used to make six calls to Lindsay. After her murder, it was never used again. This shows planning and organisation, but why? Lindsay had no known enemies. She didn't lead a high-risk lifestyle. She was a much-loved 24-year-old real estate agent who got along with everybody. The theory is that her killers were hired or arranged by somebody close to Lindsay. So who called it? Lindsay's father, Jeff Buziak, could only think of two scenarios when the news was first broken to him. Her boyfriend, Jason Zalo, or her ex-boyfriend, Matt McDuff. Police were on the same page and focused in on those two in the early part of the investigation. Matt McDuff was Lindsay's ex-boyfriend. They dated from 2001 until 2006. He was extensively questioned by police about the murder. At the time of Lindsay's murder, they had been separated for almost two years and had both moved on to new relationships. They had no contact with each other for months before the murder. Matt acknowledges that their relationship wasn't always a happy one. It was at times stormy and rocky. Lindsay could be fiery. Despite that, they had an enormous connection, which they felt was a deep love that was irreplaceable. There is no evidence at all pointing to Matt. No reason to suspect him. At the time of Lindsay's murder, he was at a location over an hour away with his new girlfriend and her family. However, information was put forward by somebody that just 24 hours before her murder, Lindsay disclosed she was afraid of Matt. This information came from Shirley Zalo, the mother of the prime suspect at the time, Jason Zalo. Shirley is the only person who has ever heard Lindsay say she was afraid of Matt. In fact, Lindsay's friends have a totally different story. They say Matt had a bit of a hold over Lindsay. They had a connection few would experience. But their relationship got too dramatic and they both knew it had to end. Jason Zalo, Lindsay's current boyfriend. The man whose girlfriend was nervous about meeting this mystery couple and requested him at the house. The man who parked past the house in the cul-de-sac for 10 minutes then drove out of the cul-de-sac and parked around the corner for another 10 minutes, meaning he waited 20 minutes before approaching the house, and he was 15 minutes late. So Lindsay had been inside for 35 minutes at a viewing she was nervous about before Jason checked on it. Police found Jason hunched over Lindsay, covered in her blood. He was handcuffed, taken to the police station, questioned for hours, and asked to give a DNA sample, which he didn't do, and refuses to this day. A few days later, Jason went with police back to 1702 de Souza Place and participated in a videotaped reenactment of his movements that day. The following audio is from that reenactment. Which side of the door was going on when when the door opened for you? Right where the door opened. So, yeah, well, I'm yeah. Just, yeah. sorry, I don't worry about it. So he opens it like this, does he open it all the way, or you just... He, un- he unlocked the door. Okay, he unlocks it, yeah. So I unlock it. Okay, it's unlocked. And I just opened it. Okay, so... So I don't know if his hand, he, I know that because I heard it unlock. Okay. Second he unlocked it, I, I pushed it open. Okay. Uh, exactly. yeah. um, he was already in front of me. Yeah. And I said, I'm running upstairs. Okay. And so I was yelling, I just was yelling, I'm like, Lindsay, Lindsay, Lindsay. And where did Cohen go? He went straight ahead. He went straight ahead? Yeah. Okay. Um, so just hang on a sec there. Uh, yeah. So he went straight ahead? Yeah. And you were, you went running upstairs? Yeah. Okay, so let me, okay, so let me go upstairs first, and then you can talk your, your way go upstairs, and then we'll go to the end, right? Mm-hmm. You okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> So I was running inside the house. Uh, I just came running up the stairs. Do you remember grabbing the banister at all, or uh, down there? Okay. Do you, what else were you doing? Did you, did you see anything? Did you hear anything? Did you smell anything? Kind of put yourself back there into into that that exact corner. The, uh, the 
the time I got to from the door to upstairs was probably two seconds. Okay, so you're like I was running up the stairs. Okay. Yeah, like I didn't walk. I didn't. The second I opened the door, I yelled Lindsay, Lindsay, uh, and then I ran. I ran up these stairs as fast as I could. Okay. It was a five-bedroom, four-bathroom executive home. In the last months of her life, Lindsay was telling family and friends she was thinking about breaking up with Jason as soon as several real estate deals closed. In December 2007, six weeks before her murder, Lindsay flew to Calgary, Alberta, to visit her father, Jeff. During that visit, she told him that her relationship with Jason wasn't working. She missed Matt, she had made a horrible mistake, and didn't know what to do about it. Lindsay's friends confirmed that's how she felt. But not long after making those comments, she went on a ski trip with Jason and his family. Lindsay's friends say on this trip, Lindsay softened, reconsidered, and decided to try and make it work with Jason. Jason says there is no truth to the stories at all that Lindsay was ready to leave him. Jason was described as being unemotional after Lindsay's death. No tears. When asked about this, Jason says people show their emotions in different ways and that he is deeply affected. He loved Lindsay, still thinks about her every day, and wants the case solved as soon as possible. Sanish police have said publicly Jason Zalo is no longer considered a suspect. Matt McDuff was never really considered a suspect at all. As part of the investigation, police have conducted 1,500 interviews, followed up on 750 tip-offs, and executed 30 search warrants but no arrests have ever been made, and no suspects have ever been named publicly by the police. So that there is your typical rundown of the story of Lindsay Buziak. But let's have a look at some other information and some other people that may or may not be related to this story. I understand that some of what I say may seem totally off topic and you may even get a little bit lost but you're gonna to have to stick with me here and pay attention. Where we are going isn't easy to get your head around, but just remember what I said at the start of the show. Victoria is one degree of separation between people. Everyone is connected to everyone to a certain extent. As you've already heard, Lindsay was dating Matt McDuff between 2001 and 2006. Matt McDuff has a twin brother, Malcolm, the McDuff brothers are hardworking and successful. Matt and Lindsay had a connection that most people never get to experience. The McDuff twins have some colourful friends. Some of their friends and acquaintances were involved in activities that led to raids on the British Columbia Legislature. This was due to a drug scandal in British Columbia Government Parliament buildings. More serious, some of these people were linked to the British Columbia Rail sell-off where political corruption was to such an extent that the Premier of British Columbia resigned and the current government is refusing to make the drugs in Parliament and rail sell-off public. Just think about that for a second. Such massive stories, and not only has it been barely reported on, the files are sealed shut. Now, where are we going with this? Well, to try and keep it as simple as possible, just know the McDuff twins had links to some of the people involved in these scandals. We aren't suggesting they are players or involved in anything illegal at all, but they had associates who were involved, and the files are still sealed. We don't really know the full extent of it. How is this relevant? Lindsay was in a relationship with Matt McDuff when all of this was going down. In fact, during the investigation, both Matt and Lindsay's phones were tapped. Shortly after breaking up with Matt, Lindsay started her real estate agent course. Ryan Zalo was on that same course. Pretty soon, suggestions from Ryan that they should study together turned into him fully hitting on her. Ryan was very keen on Lindsay and introduced her to his mother, Shirley Zalo. Shirley gave Lindsay her job at Remax Camosum Real Estate, where she was the manager. Then Lindsay caught the eye of Jason Zalo. Pretty soon, Jason constantly popping into the office with coffees for Lindsay turned into a few dates, which turned into a relationship. The early part of the relationship went well, and they decided to move in together. 
Shirley Zalo bought them a waterfront property on Shawnigan Lake, which is about a 20 minute drive north from Victoria. That was in the early summer of 2007. It was worth $1.3 million and she spent another $250,000 on renovations and furnishings. But it wasn't long before Lindsay started to see Shirley Zalo was going to be a bit of a nightmare. She described her as being controlling and demanding with massive mood swings and lots of anger. Not only that, she described Jason as controlling and possessive. Lindsay wanted out. She said she was done and was moving back to Victoria. Lindsay started looking for her own place. She wanted to be downtown, close to the gym and close to her friends. But Jason was able to woo her back and they decided to leave the place at Shawnigan Lake and they moved to a condo at a place called Shutters, located on the Victoria Inner Harbour. The condo was owned by Ryan Zalo, and they had to kick out the tenant who was already there. Shirley Zalo spent another $70,000 to repaint and refurnish the condo. They moved there in the fall of 2007. But it didn't last long. Three months later, Lindsay was freaking out. She couldn't do it anymore. In December 2007, Lindsay flew to Calgary to visit her father, Jeff Buziak. Remember, that's when she tells Jeff that things aren't working out with Jason, she still loved Matt, and she had made a terrible mistake. She had a few deals she was waiting to close, and wanted to get those deals done before leaving Jason. Well, Lindsay told Jeff something else. She mentioned she saw something she shouldn't have. Lindsay didn't elaborate on what she had seen. What was it? About a week after, Lindsay returned home. On the 22nd of December 2007, she was with her friend Nikki at her and Jason's condo. They had just returned from a night out, and it was the early hours of the morning. She told Nikki all about her problems with Jason and that she was going to break up with him. Jason was asleep at the time, and Lindsay wasn't concerned about what she was saying. But Jason wasn't asleep. He was standing up with his ear on the bedroom door, listening in. Nikki and Lindsay busted him. Nikki freaked out and ran. Lindsay went after her. Jason started calling Lindsay, but she didn't answer. That didn't stop Jason though. He kept going and going, making about 30 calls in total. Lindsay never picked up, so Jason then called his mum, Shirley Zalo. On Christmas Day, Lindsay received extremely expensive gifts from Jason and then she was taken away on a ski trip to Whistler. That's when she tells friends she's softening and reconsidering and maybe will try and make it work with Jason. And all of this leads us into the story of the biggest drug bust in the history of Alberta. On the 22nd of January 2008, 11 days before Lindsay's murder, 25 kilos of cocaine was seized from a house in Calgary. On the 28th of January 2008, another 42 kilos of cocaine was seized from the same house. The cell phone used in Lindsay's murder was activated soon after, and the call from the female with the strange accent was then made to Lindsay. Within later months, another 13 kilos of cocaine was seized from that same investigation, making that total bust 80 kilos, worth about $8 million. 14 people faced charges in total. Two of those 14 faced conspiracy to traffic charges. Ericsson Del Alcazar was one of the men to receive a conspiracy to traffic charge. Ericsson Del Alcazar from Victoria has four brothers, Edwardson, also known as Sandy, Jefferson, Eldrickson and Emerson. Their uncles are Antonio Lopez and Sorello Lopez. Sorello Lopez is currently in jail on drug trafficking charges. But at the time of Lindsay's murder, he was around. They all live around Victoria. Let's have a look at what the Del Alcazar brothers are known for. Ericsson, who went down in the biggest drug bust in the history of Alberta, also has a record for assault, resisting a peace officer, breaching a conditional sentence, aggravated assault, and breaching probation. Eldrickson is known for assault causing bodily harm and breaching probation. Jefferson is known for assault causing bodily harm, 
driving offences, breaching probation, and he has two charges for possession for the purpose of trafficking and one charge for trafficking in a controlled substance. Emerson is known for assault with a weapon, aggravated assault causing bodily harm, possession of an unauthorised firearm, and breach of undertaking. A week after Ericsson Del Alcazar gets busted, the cell phone used in the murder of Lindsay is activated. Six weeks before that drug bust, Lindsay had been in Calgary, and while she was there, she made contact with Ericsson Del Alcazar. They were both from Victoria, and Lindsay knew a lot of people. Plus, the Del Alcazar brothers are good buddies with the Macduff brothers. Yes, that is Lindsay's ex I'm referring to, Matt Macduff. It's believed her contact with Ericsson Del Alcazar was by phone only, and the nature of their contact is unknown. From there stem the rumours that Lindsay could have been the snitch in that investigation. But that's not true. The police investigation into that drug operation in Calgary started before Lindsay was even there. When she made contact with Ericsson, the investigation was already well underway. She wasn't the snitch. But what if you wanted Lindsay dead? Then suddenly that opportunity presents itself. Lindsay visits Calgary, and not long after that, an $8 million drug bust, and she had contact with the guy who got busted. Or what if you didn't necessarily want Lindsay dead, but you knew about her visit, and you knew you would be able to use it. A lot of money was lost, a lot of people angry, scrambling, panicking, finger pointing, threats being made. What if a wrong had to be made a right? Everyone answers to someone. Even though she had nothing to do with it, you could make it seem like she did. Those are just a couple of the theories flying around. Or maybe her trip and contact with Ericsson and the drug bust is just a complete coincidence. But a week after that bust, the cell phone used in Lindsay's murder was activated. Lindsay receives the call from the woman with the strange and possibly fake accent. Two days later, she's viciously murdered. Let's have a look at a couple of other friends of the Del Alcazar brothers. Edgar Acevedo, otherwise known as Vid. Vid is good friends with the Del Alcazars. The local word on the street around Victoria is that Vid could allegedly be involved in some illegal drug activity. Some there suspected, anyway. A good buddy of Vid, and the Del Alcazars as well, is Zachary Scott Matheson, otherwise known as Ziggy. Some suspect Ziggy could allegedly be involved in some illegal drug activity as well. Let's have a look at what Ziggy has been charged with over the years. Trafficking in narcotics, aggravated assault, assault with a weapon, assaulting a peace officer, possession of a controlled substance, trafficking in a controlled substance, breach of probation, possession for the purposes of trafficking, murder, use firearm committing an indictable offence, and disobeying a court order. And the last charge that appears on Ziggy's record is the 6th of June 2013, possession for the purpose of trafficking. With this last charge, Ziggy was arrested with his friend Ali Zayi. From three locations, police seized 13 kilos of marijuana, two kilos of cocaine, one kilo of crystal meth, 10 litres of the date rate drug GHB, 200 pills of ecstasy, one kilo of a cutting agent, nine millimetre ammo, scales, a money counter, and gun holsters. Guess who owned the house Ziggy was living in when he got busted with all those drugs? Shirley Zalo. Shirley owned it, Ziggy rented it, for five years. After the bust, Shirley came out publicly and said that neither her nor her family had any association with Ziggy and had no idea what he was using her house for. She said she couldn't be held responsible for the actions of her tenant. But then you go on Facebook and see Ziggy played in the same hockey team as Jason and Ryan Zalo, and they're smiling and posing for pictures together. Then you hear the stories that the Zalos were always hanging out and are indeed very close to Ziggy, and to his good buddy Vid as well. It's one of the larger drug busts to have happened on the Lower Island. In some reports, police are quoted as saying these are solid mid-level guys. Other reports, police are quoted as saying they are at the top of the chain in Victoria. Who really knows? It was big either way. Ali Zayi has since pleaded guilty. 
As part of his plea agreement, he doesn't have to testify at Ziggy's trial. Zaye was sentenced to two and a half years jail. Those in the know say that sentence seemed pretty light, considering the size of the bust. We can only speculate why that may be. Ziggy's trial is set for later this year. There has already been all sorts of delays and motions and whatever else, so who knows if it will actually go ahead when it is scheduled. Ziggy's lawyer is Brad Hickford, the same lawyer that the Zalos called straight after Lindsay Buziak's murder, the same lawyer that is seen on the reenactment video Jason did with Saanich police days after her murder. Also, you remember when I was reading through some of Ziggy's criminal history, I mentioned the murder charge. Let's go through a quick rundown of that. Ziggy was in a romantic relationship with a girl, Shannon. Their relationship ended in February in the year 2000. A few days after the split, Shannon turned up to Liquid Nightclub with a man by the name of Kevin Black. They appeared to be romantically together. Also present at Liquid Nightclub was Ziggy and his friend David Nebergel. Ziggy wasn't happy seeing Shannon and Kevin strutting into the nightclub holding hands. There was tension. After leaving the club, Shannon and Kevin went back to Shannon's place. Kevin was shot dead and Shannon was near beaten to death. David Nebergel and Ziggy were both charged with Kevin's murder. Ziggy alone was charged with assaulting Shannon with a weapon, the weapon being a handgun. Shannon was beaten to within an inch of her life and was unrecognisable to her parents. Shannon ended up surviving the attack, but died of a heroin overdose before the trial. The word is that Shannon was known more for her cocaine use than heroin. After that, the Crown made an offer to Ziggy and David. If someone pleads guilty to the murder of Kevin Black, the other one will be let off, and the person who pleads will get the minimum 10 years non-parole sentence. At first, neither accepted. Then David started mentioning he was considering the idea. His legal counsel advised him no, they were totally against it. But David decided to take the deal. His counsel withdrew from representing him and David had to get new counsel. He pled guilty and was sentenced to life, with a non-parole period of 10 years, the minimum as promised. Now back to the Zalos. The property at 1702 D'Souza Place, where Lindsay was killed, was a new development. The property developer, Joe D'Souza, had just subdivided the land and was building new houses. The house next door was still being constructed, but the builders packed up and left at 5pm, making 5.30pm a good time to book a viewing in that area if you wanted to ensure the minimum amount of people would be around. Joe D'Souza was good friends with Paul Bergshoff, Paul had moved to Victoria from the Netherlands with his family. He later split from his wife and hooked up with Shirley Zalo. He was still in a relationship with Shirley Zalo at the time of Lindsay's murder. So Shirley's boyfriend Paul is good buddies with Joe. Joe is the developer who built 1702 D'Souza Place where Lindsay was murdered. After the murder, Jeff Buziak confronted Joe D'Souza after being told Joe was overheard saying, the bitch got what she deserved, referencing Lindsay. Joe denied making that comment. A few years after the murder, Joe's good buddy Paul, Shirley's now ex-boyfriend, suddenly packed up, sold his business interests and moved back to the Netherlands. His ex-wife and kids still remain in Victoria. Paul isn't talking. Remember the three fence boards that were kicked out along the rear fence of 1702 D'Souza Place? You could walk through the gap and not be seen from the road due to the trees and shrubs. From there, you could walk out onto Torquay Drive, or you could go to the house behind. The front yard of the house behind connected to the backyard of 1702 D'Souza Place. The garage of that house behind was close by as well. This brings us to another story or theory of what happened that day. The story of Terry Sheen's alleged behaviour. Terry Sheen lived in the house on Torquay Drive, located behind the murder house. This is all alleged, a story various people online will tell you. But on the day of Lindsay's murder, Terry Sheen was said to be at home by himself most of the day. His wife was with one of their sons at a sporting tournament. We will call him Jake. 
Their other son was in Vancouver visiting a friend. We will call him Dale. That day, Terry told his wife to take his car to the sporting tournament. Something that was unusual. He never usually let her drive his car. That meant Terry would now be driving his wife's minivan. Terry called Dale, who was in Vancouver, and told him to get on the later ferry back to the island. That now meant that Terry jumped into his wife's minivan and left to pick up Dale from the ferry, just before the cops arrived next door, responding to Lindsay's murder. Terry picked up Dale, who was expecting to go straight home, but Terry had other ideas. Terry wanted to go to the sporting tournament and then out for dinner. Dale didn't want to, so Terry left him and went to meet up with his wife and other son Jake, who was still at the sporting tournament. When Dale got back to Torquay Drive and saw the cops and news crews everywhere, he called Terry in a panic. The cops even told Dale they had to search their house, as the killer could still be on the loose. Dale relayed all this information to Terry, who didn't seem concerned at all. He told Dale to chill out and get something to eat. By the way, Terry didn't tell his wife any of this. So Terry and his wife head out for dinner with Jake, which they didn't really want to do either. They had been at the sporting tournament all day, but Terry insisted. Terry made no mention of the cops and news crews next door, no mention of their house getting searched. Terry had been unemployed for a little while. He was fired from his last job due to some money issues. He worked at Victoria Golf Club. The Victoria Golf Club is where the wake was held for Lindsay, which was organised by the Zalos. The day after Lindsay's murder, Terry cleaned his wife's minivan, gave it a detail. That story is what is alleged by some. Terry Sheen has never come forward to either confirm or to deny it. Cohen Oatman, remember him, the business partner of Jason. The word is that Cohen and Jason weren't all that tight. In fact, Cohen was said to be somewhat surprised when Jason invited him out for dinner. He didn't even really want to go. Jason had to plead with him. So eventually Cohen agreed, turned up, met Jason at SHC, jumped in his Range Rover, thinking they were headed out for dinner, not knowing they were going to check on Lindsay. Jason didn't mention that until they were in the car and already on the way. When Jason made the call to his brother Ryan to get directions, Ryan was with a girl called Ashley Lum, sister to Michelle Lum. Michelle Lum, another one of these people said to allegedly be involved in some criminal activity. Her record shows that she has been charged with unlawful confinement or imprisonment and possession for the purpose of trafficking. She was also a witness in a murder trial in 2006. She lived a block and a half away from where Lindsay was killed, and it's rumoured around Victoria that she is very fond of a short-cropped blonde wig. The timing of Lindsay's murder is pretty interesting too, as if there wasn't enough going on here. The day before her murder, Friday the 1st of February 2008, seven experienced senior police officers retired from the Saanich Police Department, including three detectives, one of which was their main senior lead detective who would have been calling the shots on Lindsay's case. Between those seven officers, they had a combined experience of 210 years in policing. So they all retire the day before Lindsay gets murdered. There is a big retirement function that Friday night. The next day, Lindsay. A lot of their experienced guys had just left, and now they have a brutal murder of a young girl in a place not known for its brutal murders. Despite this, Saanich police ran with it, refused to call back any of their experienced guys. They never contacted any of them for help. In fact, one approached the department and asked to be let back on to work it. He was told no, they were fine, they had it under control. During the course of the investigation, the detectives working the case were locked away in a separate room. Access was monitored and extremely secure. This was done as Saanich police felt there may be a leak. A few years after the murder, Shirley Zalo started dating an ex-Saanich police officer. There may be something to the location of Saanich too. In Victoria, there are five different police departments that cover an area with a population of about 450,000 people. It's thought that this causes a lot of fractured policing. 
So the Attorney General implemented a new strategy. He formed the Vancouver Island Integrated Major Crime Unit, a specialised team of police major crime investigators better equipped to deal with major crimes, such as Lindsay's. But Saanich police elected not to be a part of that major crime squad. The reason they gave was that their homicide detectives solve most of their cases on their own and in a cost-effective way. During the course of Lindsay's investigation, a Saanich police officer was asked if maybe they should have joined that major crime unit. He said no. He didn't regret not joining the unit and he didn't think the choice had anything to do with why Lindsay's case remains unsolved. But retired RCMP homicide investigator Ray Keelan, who used to provide support to these smaller departments, has the view that rather than err on the side of caution, you want to err on the side of expending as much effort and doing all that you can to solve the case. He says that integrated units, such as the Vancouver Island Integrated Major Crime Unit, can often provide help with unsolved files. But it's up to Saanich Police if they want the help. It's now been eight years. No arrests have been made and they've never even named a suspect after they quickly cleared Jason Zaylor. The major crime unit can't take over Lindsay's case. The only one that has the authority to turn it over is the Saanich Police Department. And for unknown reasons, they don't want to do that. Despite the fact that Jeff Buziak was called into the station and told that Lindsay's case is no longer being actively investigated, and the officer in charge of the case, Detective Horsley, has been reassigned. Saanich police refuse to let go of Lindsay's file. Their case, that's it. Hopefully they reconsider. Especially when you consider the fact, and now this becomes even stranger, Saanich police are now part of that integrated major crime unit. They recently joined up to it. So now they are a part of that major crime unit, yet they still refuse to let go of Lindsay's file even though they aren't actively investigating it and it's just sitting there. The day after Lindsay's murder, 22-year-old real estate agent Jasmine Parsons got a call from a woman with a heavy accent. The female caller said, Can you come over? I want to list my house. Jasmine said, OK, what's your address? The female caller said, oh, You know what? I'm not sure. Can I call you back? She never called back. Jasmine Parsons is Jason Zalo's ex-girlfriend. A few days after that, still only days after Lindsay's murder, Lindsay's friend Nikki was woken up by a phone call. Nikki answered and a female speaking in a weird accent started talking. Nikki was still half asleep so didn't catch what was being said. But it didn't take long for her to be struck with fear when she remembered Lindsay was called by a female with a strange accent. Nikki asked the caller who she was and what she wanted, but the caller hung up. Nikki was able to call the number back. She called it 20 to 30 times repeatedly before someone finally answered. Shirley Zalo. Nikki asked her what was going on. Shirley responded nothing. This story is strongly denied by Shirley, who says Nikki is crazy. When confronted about it, Shirley said her office manager's name is Nikki, and she scrolled through her phone, saw the name Nikki, and pressed it, not realising it was the wrong Nikki. When asked how and why she had Nikki's number, being Lindsay's friend Nikki, not her office manager, she said Jason must have put it in. Nikki was the friend with Lindsay that night they were in the condo when Jason was listening in on their conversation. There is another interesting story about Jason Zalo going around and his actions and what he said when he was released from Saanich Police Station after Lindsay's murder. Police had his Range Rover seized and their condo was locked down. It's alleged by some he travelled to a friend's house where there were other people present as well and he seemed to be petrified that bikers were coming after him. It seems his fear was magnified because of Lindsay's murder. If this is true, it's interesting that someone whose girlfriend was just savagely murdered would instantly be terrified that bikers were coming after him. Why would he be thinking that instead of deeply mourning the loss of Lindsay? Everyone else was crying and mourning deeply about Lindsay, not wondering whether bikers were coming after them. 
Obviously, Jason has never publicly stated this. It's just another story circulating around Lindsay's case and what he allegedly said once he was released from the police station. Now we go back to Vid. Sorry, I know I'm jumping around a bit with this one, and I understand this isn't the easiest story to get your head around. But just remember, Victoria is a place where everyone is connected to everyone to a certain extent. Vid's good buddy and close associate is Medardo Rivas. Medardo is also tight with the Del Alcazars. Allegedly, Vid and Medardo were doing quite well for themselves before Lindsay's murder. Flash cars and all the rest of it. Successful businessmen. But since Lindsay's murder, people say they haven't been doing so well financially. Now, you're interested in true crime and listen to true crime podcasts. So I know that you know all about cell phone records and cell phone tower pings. Well, yes, that's where we're going now. The murder phone was found to have travelled to Victoria via ferry the day before Lindsay's murder. I've been told that cell phone records show when that phone got to the island, Vid Acevedo's phone allegedly pinged in the same location as the murder phone when it came in on the ferry. The murder phone and his phone are then said to have pinged off the same tower later that night as well, the one that's close to his house. I have also been told that there are phone records that show four people all come together suddenly from different parts of Victoria, one hour after Lindsay's murder, at which time all their phones started to ping together. The four people are allegedly Vid Acevedo, Medardo Rivas, Edwardson and Eldrickson Del Alcazar. I haven't seen these records, I don't have them in my possession. I'm just passing on information that has been relayed to me while researching this case. So again, those cell phone records are all very much allegedly. In a place where everybody knows everyone, there'd be a chain, a hierarchy. What if somebody panicked, went after Lindsay rashly, a desperate attempt to right a wrong, save face, shift blame, send a message? Maybe they didn't think it through. That's just another one of quite a few theories that are out there about this case anyway. Ziggy is alleged to have been overheard saying that Lindsay's murder was a big mistake. Saanich police aren't currently working on the investigation. The officers have been reassigned. It's not being actively worked. But Jeff Buziak isn't sitting back and letting his daughter's memory fade, allowing her killers and conspirators to walk free. Each year, there is a walk for justice through Saanich in memory of Lindsay. On the 31st of January 2016, Jeff Buziak was in Victoria when this happened. But in a stunning development, Jeff Buziak claims he not only knows who killed his daughter, he says he was threatened by them this week. Two days ago, I was confronted by one of the people involved in Lindsay's murder. Um, he bullied me, intimidated me, called me down, profanity, uh, threatened me with physical violence. The police were called. Buziak says there was also an incident at the Victoria Courthouse on Monday involving a drug dealer with a long and violent criminal record who he says knows who killed his daughter. You can see images of Vid Acevedo confronting Jeff Buziak online. A link will be provided in the show notes. Here is Jeff commenting further about who he believes is responsible for Lindsay's murder. A group of local thugs who decided they wanted to put out a message for people who squawk on them. So they singled out my daughter and slaughtered her. Saanich police won't comment on whether the people Buziak thinks killed his daughter are suspects or persons of interest. Jeff says that Matt McDuff is in constant contact with him, always trying to help out. The Zalos, on the other hand, he says, have never offered any help at all in the hunt for Lindsay's killers. Business, though, continues to go extremely well for the Zalos. Flash houses, fast cars, expensive boats, no shortage of cash. Real estate and mortgages continue to be very profitable in Victoria. What did Lindsay know? What did she see? She told Jeff she saw something she shouldn't have. 
It's believed all of the mentioned groups in this story know what happened. They all casually accuse each other from time to time. But where lies the truth in the place where everyone is connected to everyone, to a certain extent? It's believed that nobody wants to talk because they are all connected. Connected to the extent that Lindsay's murder occurred one day after seven senior police officers retired and not one was called back to work the case. Lindsay's murder is a murder mystery of epic proportions because so much is known, so much is out there, so much is talked about, but who called it and why? We contacted the Saanich Police Department and Detective Chris Horsley, the officer in charge of the case, was good enough to speak to us. He actually listened to the episode before our conversation. This is him commenting on Jeff Buziak's claims he knows who killed Lindsay. Well, I believe uh, Mr. Buziak obviously, you know, is searching for answers as we all are. However, I don't believe Mr. Buziak has any particular knowledge or definitive proof regarding the person responsible for his daughter's murder. I mean, Jeff and I have had lots of conversations over the years, and, you know, I'm a father myself, and I certainly, you know, can't even imagine, you know, what he's gone through, but he's very, very committed to finding out who's responsible for his daughter. And it really has gone through some phases over the years where, you know, he believed a certain group of parties are responsible and not switched to another group. Um, but, you know, he has people that are assisting him in his own private investigation. And uh, based on some of the circumstances he's, you know, he's discovered, he thinks he's on to the people responsible. We have been told that Lindsay's case is no longer being actively investigated. This is what Detective Horsley had to say about that. Yeah, there's been a lot of misunderstanding. The reality is, is for... A good portion of time, we had a dedicated team. Obviously, we have hundreds of investigations, just like every other police department in the world. Um, but we were dedicating people full time to Lindsay's file. And uh, that went on for about two and a half years. Um, however, uh, some of the people that were involved were redeployed, meaning that they, you know, they had transfers, they went to other sections. However, the file's still active. I mean, we're not going to close down an active murder investigation. It's simply not going to happen, nor would any other police agency. So some of the people, yes, have moved on. But right now in the detective division, four of the people that were part of that full-time team are still working in detectives and are still assigned to Lindsay's case. I mean, even this week, we receive uh, tips and leads from members of the public. Uh, I just reviewed some. So even though... Uh, as Jeff probably has told you, um, you know, my transfer, you know, is pending one of these days, but I'm still acting as the person who oversees uh, the investigation. And even this week, I've reviewed tips that have come in from the public. And of course, all those tips need to be followed up. So they're still actively investigating. And uh, it's by no means what people would describe as a cold case. It's certainly not sitting on a shelf somewhere. The internet is... You know, I've been in policing, uh, you know, over 20 years now, and I've never uh, had an experience with an investigation like this. I think partly because when Lindsay's murder happened, it was right on the cusp of uh, social media really exploding. So what we have is a murder investigation that's really being... Uh, put out there in the public domain. I mean, not by the police. We, we don't share information with the public, but people are putting their own thoughts and their own theories out there in the public domain through the internet and through blogs. I don't think it's a bad thing. I really don't. But the vast majority of the information that's being put out there is, is simply not true. The investigation is, uh, I described it once to someone, it's like an iceberg. And as most people know, 90% of that iceberg is under the water and you don't see it. And that's exactly the way this police investigation has gone. The public have only seen the 10% that's above the water. And of what is being discussed about that 10% above the water, about 90% of that's incorrect. So it's tough for us as a police organization. We'd love to stand up and say, no, you're incorrect about that and you're incorrect about this. But it's not really our place. We're trying to solve the murder and, uh, you know, we don't investigate through social media. We certainly will use it to our advantage, but we're not in a position where we're going to be reporting out our successes and our failures because we've had both over the last eight years and uh, we don't do it in the public domain. You know, Victoria has, has 
you're probably aware, you know, it's not a huge city at 300,000 people. I mean, people, everybody seems to know everybody, lots of connections. There's nowhere that I go, whether it's the grocery store or out for dinner, where people don't associate me with this file. And people will come up to me and talk to me. Um, what I find interesting is that of all the people posting on the Internet, and there's hundreds of them, I'm sure, and using anonymous names, not one of them's ever bothered to phone me. I've never received a phone call other than Jeff Buziak himself. He's the only person who's actually picked up the phone and said, Chris, I got a question for you. None of the other members of the public did. They'll just post random thoughts, innuendo, rumor, but no one's ever actually given me a phone call. And I've made it clear through Jeff Buziak that my phone's, it's still sitting on my desk. It still rings. I'll always give you a call back. When asked if Saanich police ever made anything of the timing of the murder, with the three detectives and seven police in total retiring the day before, this is what he said. You know what? We didn't. I mean, to think that someone is... I mean, I know that conspiracy theories are run amok here, but do you really think that someone's planning a murder based on the retirement schedule of the Sanish Police Department? I mean, I don't even know if those retirements were public knowledge until after the people already left. Um, there's been lots of stuff posted on the internet about why didn't you call them back? Well, we don't have that authority. These people aren't in the Army. They've, they've worked for a municipal police department, and they've retired. Like, they're, they're off the pension. We have zero ability to call these people back into work if they don't want to. And furthermore, nobody offered. There's been a lot of talk about the seven, you know, senior officers. I mean, the majority of these people never even worked in the detective division. So uh, their experience you know, the door was in different areas of policing. Those that did work in the detective division, they didn't offer to come back. Um, and, you know, nor would we expect them to. They've retired, they've gone out the door to pension, and they're on to the rest of their lives. And, you know, that, that happens in every police department. You lose knowledge, you lose that skill set, and we do our best to, uh, to ensure that we have training for those transition periods. And the people we had on this investigation were very, very experienced. And I have no doubt that the quality of their abilities is no different than those that went out the door. He now comments about whether or not one of the retired detectives asked to be let back onto the investigation. Well, I believe that one of the retired detectives offered Jeff Buziak to come back to Mr. Buziak. However, that offer didn't come to the Sanish Police Department. Um, you know, he didn't come into our agency and say, look, I'm willing to come back to work and help you on this. Uh, and my understanding is, is that even that offer to Mr. Buziak was some time after the murder, like two years at least. So it's not like uh, the weekend of the murder, we received a call from someone offering to help out. That did not happen. We then asked Detective Horsley if he could explain why the case hasn't been handed over to the Integrated Major Crime Unit. The simple reason is the the way that it's structured is that the Vancouver Island Integrated Major Crime Unit does not take on historical cases. So this case, at the time of the murder, we were not part of that unit. Therefore, the way the management structure is, is that we're responsible for the homicide investigation. Um, you know, the Sanish police are part of that unit today, but they still do not take on historical cases. So uh, they have a heavy workload, as do we. But I think what people need to understand is that many of the people that worked on Lindsay's case within the Sanish police came from backgrounds similar to that integrated major crime unit. Primarily the primary investigator who had worked 20 years with the RCMP and uh, before coming to Saanich and had more major crime experience than anybody that we actually sent to the, the integrated unit. So there's no doubt in my mind that we had experienced people making the decisions on this case. Information about the existence of phone records was provided to us. We asked Detective Horsley if he could comment on those. No, because uh, the phone records obviously pertain to individuals in the community. Um, you know, there's lots of names that are being thrown out. We obviously aren't naming suspects. We're not in a position to name anybody in the file through, you know, freedom of information legislation. The only time that we can ever mention anyone is if a public document has been uh, issued. So if we do get to a charge approval stage and charges are approved by the prosecution, and that name becomes a matter of public record and we would release it. But up until that point, we simply can't, we can't discuss people's personal records or the names of the individuals involved. We moved on to the incident involving Vid and Jeff Buziak. 
Well, Mr. Buziak and I have had discussions about that, and uh, Mr. Buziak has been, you know, a champion for his daughter. And when he comes to Victoria, he certainly will seek out people that he believes are persons of interest. And in this case, he did just that. And, uh, you know, a discussion ensued on the on the road. Um, you know, I can't really get into exactly what took place. However, the police did attend and formed the opinion that no criminal event occurred. Uh, the individual involved went his own way, and then Mr. Buziak went his, and that was the end of it. These were Detective Horsley's general thoughts on the case and the podcast. You know, some of the things that people take as the gospel are certainly incorrect. Um, you know, the poor, the poor victim there, injuries to the victim were never disclosed. An autopsy report's never been disclosed. So although we've admitted that this was a, a horrific attack, we've never indicated any type of injury or natures of injuries. Um, one thing off the top of my head, I know on the podcast it mentioned uh, when the witnesses showed up at the murder house that, you know, there was people seen through obscured glass. Um, the fact of the matter is the people were actually seen. Um, the door was open and the witnesses actually observed uh, the male suspect exiting the house. So um, just lots of little things that, you know, we've tried to clarify. I certainly have had a lot of discussions with Jeff Buziak over the years, but, um, you know, we don't expect it to be 100% correct. However, you know, we wish that uh, the rumor, the innuendo, all those things, uh, you know, didn't exist on the level that they do. Uh, by and large, the podcast is a, is a fairly accurate portrayal of, of the events uh, leading up to the murder. Um, certainly, uh, certainly little things, but, I mean, like I said, they're little. However, I think the bigger picture here when you step back is, you know, this is going to be one of the probably first murder trials where the Internet is going to play a large part, which is, you know, how many potential suspects have been posted on the Internet? Have they all been ruled out? Um, it makes for a daunting task for whatever agency investigating any crime like this when so many potential suspects are being discussed openly because obviously the prosecution is going to have to shut down all those avenues and prove that those people, in fact, weren't responsible. That in itself makes the workload absolutely mammoth, and uh, that's what a large part of our job is. Every tip we receive, we have to document, and every tip we receive, we have to show that that tip is a dead end, and uh, that is a huge task. I think we're dealing with people that have obviously shown that they're willing to uh, inflict severe violence on people. And with any homicide of this nature, uh, where we strongly believe that a conspiracy to commit murder has occurred, these people planned to kill Lindsay. And coming forward could potentially make, make that person a target. So, of course, there's a, an element of fear there. Do we believe that there are people in the greater Victoria area that are in a position of knowledge regarding the murder? Absolutely. We certainly do. And uh, we certainly believe that those people may have the knowledge that we need to uh, be successful in this case. I know a lot of people in Greater Victoria. I really do from all sorts of walks of life. And is it possible that I've had conversation with someone who is uh, potentially involved in, the con in this conspiracy to commit murder? Absolutely. I believe that's, that there's actually probably a high probability that I have spoken to someone involved in this crime. And if anyone out there has information on the case, this is what you can do. They certainly can phone the Saanich Police. They can contact me directly. They can contact us through uh, tips at the SaanichPolice.ca email address. And ultimately, they can contact Crime Stoppers and remain anonymous if they wish to do so. This is what Detective Horsley thinks about whether or not the case will be solved. Absolutely. Absolutely. The people responsible for this case is completely solvable. Um, I think maybe there was a, a down point, maybe, you know, a couple of years in, there was a high level of frustration. But I believe in my heart that this, this file is completely solvable and that, in fact, we're perhaps far closer than the public realized to actually solving this case. So the team has worked very, very hard. We work ultimately for Lindsay's mom, Evelyn. We work hard for Lindsay's father, Jeff, and her sister, Sarah. But ultimately, we work for Lindsay. And although I've had some very difficult conversations with family members, and I can certainly feel their frustration because they're not getting information from us, ultimately, I'm working for Lindsay, and I'm working for the end goal of finding the people responsible and ensuring they're brought to justice.
Here are some final words from Jeff Buziak. People need to know I speak for Lindsay, not for me. I also speak on behalf of Lindsay's family, friends, the community, and all women out there that at one time or another have felt that uneasiness in their being, that something wasn't right, and they feared for their safety. That shouldn't be. I know Lindsay's last words would have been, Daddy, help! I wasn't there. Jason Zalo wasn't there. The police weren't there. So Lindsay had to face her executioners alone. That tears me apart every day. But at the same time, it motivates me to never give up on our precious Lindsay, no matter what. Lindsay's cry needs to be heard. The cry of women in fear everywhere needs to be heard. Violence against women needs to stop. Saanich police need to solve this murder to stop that cry and send out the clear message that violence against women will not be tolerated. We are all still mourning the loss of our precious Lindsay. The community is angry and scared because Lindsay's murder has not been solved. The police provide no proof they are doing their job. It's now eight and a half years with no resolution in sight. So where is this unsolved murder going? Well, there is a dedicated team, including myself, working seven days a week on Lindsay's unsolved murder. There are other fabulous people who dedicate their time, energy, and resources to assisting us to close in on the conspirators and murderers. We gain ground on them every day. The police say they need the public's help solving Lindsay's murder, and we're giving it to them with a gusto and commitment they have never experienced before. We follow every tip. We follow every rumor. We follow all information we receive and turn it over to the police while respecting those who provide it to us. Let's not fool each other. Not everyone wants to talk to the police, nor do they want their names mentioned. We respect that. We're all in, though. We do things the police cannot do. There is no holding back for us, but we stay within the law. What do I want to say about the police? Do I need to say anything? It's been eight and a half years since Lindsay was murdered. We have nothing. Nothing. The police give us nothing. I respect the police, but they need to put some effort into this eight and a half years who takes eight and a half years to do a job which is nowhere near completion if this is how the world operated we would have all been dead a long time ago world wars have been resolved in four years world wars think about that all we have here is a little girl murdered in her own community by people from her community and the police have been dumbfounded for eight and a half years We're all crying out, what the hell is going on here? This is what we get from Saanich police, though. Lots of explanations, lots of talk about how trained, dedicated, and hardworking they are. Lots of excuses about how complicated this murder is. More excuses, more explanations, and now blaming and minimizing what we do. Why don't they just shut up and arrest someone, for God's sake? That's all we want, today, not tomorrow. We all want the police to get on with their job and stop explaining, blaming, minimizing, and giving us all their bloody explanations and excuses. If they are as good as they claim they are, then arrest someone and put this nightmare to rest for all of us, please. Lindsay cried out for help. Her friends and family are all crying out for help. The community wants help. Where the hell are the police? We are all doing our part. Why don't the police just do theirs? Thank you all for listening. We also reached out to other people mentioned in this episode. Jason, Ryan and Shirley Zalo, Vid Acevedo, Terry Sheen, David Nabergel, Michelle Lum, Erickson, Jefferson and Eldrickson Del Alcazar. 
Out of all those people, Jefferson is the only one who responded, saying that he and his brothers would love to chat. But we never heard anything back when trying to set that up. We were also unsuccessful in contacting Paul Bergshoff and Ziggy. The offer still stands for anyone who wants to talk. We can do a follow-up episode. We can do several follow-up episodes. No problem. There are people out there who know what happened. When will the truth come out?